So I'm absolutely delighted today that we have Professor Heinz Faustmann here. He's with the University of Vienna. He is a professor of applied geography, but also a specialist in the issue of migrants and refugees. He's been on a tour of China uh, discussing that issue here. It's his first visit to Hong Kong, which we're very excited about. And he's here to tell us what the situation is in Europe. Europe versus the refugees, a very interesting title. What next? We'll hear from Professor Fossman and have time for Q&A. Professor? Yes, thank you, Tara, for your warm welcome. Um, I'm happy to be here in Hong Kong. Um, um, my first chapter, so-called, are facts and figures um, to give you some information about um, the issue I'm talking. Um, Europe is, or more precisely, the EU is experiencing one of the most significant migration flows, migration influx and refugees after the Second World War um, from outside of Europe. Um, the refugees are pushed, what we called in our, in our, um, in our refugee research by proximate cause, by causes which are directly affected um, refugees to come. These are um, mostly uh, wars, conflicts, or political persecution. Um, and behind that, there are so-called root causes. Not every uh, refugee is a political refugee. Some are changing um, the country because of the hope to have a better life um, in Europe. We call this uh, the root causes. Um, uh, nevertheless, a high number of people where both um, um, factors came together, proximate cause and root causes, have fled um, from the Middle East and Africa to, to Europe. 1.3 million is the number of refugees into Europe in 2015. Um, and when I compare this number with the numbers years before, um, 280 is one year before you see this is a significant, um, a significant change. The refugee uh, crisis goes on in 2016, but um, um, the nation states, the commission, and the politicians reacted, and there is, how I can say, a, a slight moderation going on. Which countries are from which countries our migrants are coming from. You see here um, very clearly the conflict in Syria um, is one of the biggest driver um, for migration um, of the refugees. But there is also ongoing violences in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, there are abuses in Eritrea as well. There is a significant poverty in Albania or Kosovo, which are parts of the West Balkan. Um, and these are the countries where most of the refugees are coming from. Where are the migrants going? And this is part of the European problem, because there is a high concentration um, on some countries. Um, Germany is one of the countries uh, which is which is very popular for refugees, if I say it in such a way. Uh, 2015, Germany alone took over 900,000 refugees. Sweden comes next with 160,000, and Austria is, on, let's say, on the third place with 90,000 refugees um, hosted in, in Austria. In, in the statistics of Eurostat, um, Hungary ranks um, I think on the second place with 180,000, but these are only registered refugees. If a, a refugee is registered and he or she sees an opportunity to leave Hungary, they do it. Um, so therefore, this is more statistical. If you bring it um, or if you calculate a per capita rate of refugees, um, then you see that Sweden, um, 17 refugees, uh, or asylum uh, seekers per 1,000 inhabitants. Austria is following on the second place with 10 per 1,000. Um, Germany on the third place with six. 
the average in the EU is 2.6. So the difference between Sweden um, with 17 and the EU average, there is a large difference. So high concentration in Europe is a specific issue. If you would compare it to China, um, let's say Austrian circumstances transferred to China, that would mean China has to take over 14 million uh, refugees, 1% uh, uh, of the living population within one year. Um, how do migrants get to Europe? You can see here the map. Um, this, the most popular route until March 2015, this is a so-called Balkan route. Um, many asylum seekers take uh, the short voyage from Turkey to the island of Kos, Chios, Lefos, and other Greek silent, uh, islands within these small um, rubber dinghies and wooden boats. Uh, but since March 2016, the so-called West Balkan route is closed. Um, Austria took over one of this initiative um, to close this Balkan route. Um, and the countries along this route started to close the borders or to control the borders. Sometimes they are building fences um, to, to have more control. Now there is a shift of this main route from Turkey via Greece to Central Europe to Libya, Italy, um, and maybe um, to Central Europe later. How dangerous is the journey? It's a dangerous journey. Um, we have no real um, statistics about the death toll, uh, but there are many um, um, deaths migrants uh, because of sunken boats. Um, the IOM estimates around 4,000 in the year 2015. The main reasons were the overcrowded small boats. Um, this is the product of capitalistic thinking of the smugglers that want to maximize the profit. My second chapter is what is unsettling Europe, what is unsettling our population. Uh, clear, it is the figures, the numbers are unsettling. Um, um, in Austria, it's, it's obviously so 90,000 asylum seekers, 1% of the population within one year. Um, in comparison with the last years, with the last year, this is more than three times higher. Or if I argue as a demographer, I would say the population in Greece uh, due to refugee in migration um, is, is compared to the last 20 years three times higher. So that means we have to build more apartments. We have to, um, we have to accelerate our economy that more workplaces are there. Um, we have to build more classes because it's an, it's an extra, um, it's an extra dynam dynamic population surplus. Um, and we see that integration, the integration of the refugees which are allowed to stay will take longer, longer than some NGOs are expected. Um, in Germany, it's obvious the same. You have on the right side um, a figure which show it, I think, very impressive. There are two peaks in the curve of asylum seekers during the time. Um, the, one, the one peak um, are the refugees from Yugoslavia after the end of um, or the broken down process of Yugoslavia. Many Bosnian Herzegovinas uh, came to Germany, but it was half so high as it is now. Um, in normal years, uh, Germany, uh, in Germany, uh, 20 to um, 50,000 applications were made, and in 2015, 900,000 applications were made. So you get a feeling there is something going on, and this is unsettling the, the, the people. Sometimes they have the feeling we are over flooded, and there is something going on, what is called the new Völkerwanderung, the new migration of, of whole, um, 
of all of all people. What is unsettling? The images, that's clear. So the journalist, journalist and the media, they have a great responsibility in that respect. You see one picture, but you have many, many pictures seen. This is a picture of the refugees coming from Budapest, walking along the highway to Vienna. This is a very unsecure and a very strange situation. People saw it on the television and they asked themselves what's happened here, that thousands of people are walking on the highway where the cars are driving very fast. Um, the images transmitted um, left the impression um, the state is losing the control. Um, and that's a very critical moment for the state when the people think the state is losing control. What is unsettling? Um, for me, as a migration researcher, and I'm a, how I can say, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of the European Union, um, and all these legal regulation which are coming from the European Union, and we have a legal regulation which is called Common European Asylum System, try to uniform the 28 different asylum systems of Europe into one uniform system with some different standards. Um, so, uh, Dublin regulation is a part of this common European asylum system and within this Dublin regulation, I'm sure you heard about it, the question who is responsible to take over asylum seekers, who is responsible for the procedure is clarified, is written down and undersigned by the member states. And I was surprised, um, negatively surprised, that this Dublin regulation could be, could be ignored by countries, by most of the countries, without any consequences. And my home country, Vienna, Austria, also ignored um, the Dublin regulation and ordered buses to bring the asylum seekers from the Slovenian border to the German border. So this is not in the sense and following the idea of the Dublin regulation. Um, so this was the policy and our foreign minister Kurz called it, this is the waving through policy. So that means asylum seekers go through, um, go through our country, go to the next country. We want to avoid to take the responsibility of, of organizing the asylum procedure, waving through from one border to the other one. What is unsettling? We are, or people are unsettling and have some concerns that conflicts will be imported. A fear that the Middle East conflicts will spill over to Europe. Um, and once again, um, in the media we can observe attacks um, in the name of Allah um, in Paris, in Nice, in Brussels, in Würzburg, in Ansbach, and many other places. And our security, um, secret security um, agency, though, they have a look um, to see what happened to the returning um, IS fighters, um, and they see them as a security risk. Unsettling is finally um, the shift a shift of the right-wing parties. Voters are swinging now to right-wing parties all over Europe as a consequence of, of the influx of asylum seekers, as a consequence of the feeling the state is losing control. All these parties which argue in law and order terms, they are gaining popularity. It's, it's rational, it's clear. Um, it's a consequence of this feeling in, in large parts of the uh, population. I listed here some names of these more right-wing parties. They have all different names. That is not so important. But the tendency in Europe is quite the same. Right-wing parties are gaining. Integration, um, my third chapter. Is it a burden or a potential? Because it's clear um, asylum seekers will stay. Um, some of them will stay, a large proportion will stay, and we have to ask ourselves, is it a burden or a potential? I give you three different answers. 
Uh, the first answer is the answer of a demographer. I would say yes, it's a potential. These are young people. Um, you see here the age pyramid of Afghanistan citizens living in Austria, 1st of January 2016. Um, there is a huge overproportion of male, um, but this will um, um, level out in the coming years when family reunification starts. But these are young people. They want to do something. They want to work. They want to learn. Um, um, this could be a potential for an aging country when the baby boomers enter into the retirement. Um, they are coming maybe a little bit too early because the baby boomers are, not, are entering into retirement in the next beginning with the next five years. But they are here and can learn and contribute. Uh, it's potential and burden due to the qualification. We, we, we made surveys and asked um, asylum seekers um, um, uh, uh, which qualifications do you bring with you? Um, and the qualification pattern is quite diverse. We have around one-fifth arguing and saying we have some university degree, but on the other side, one-fourth are illiterates or have only a very basic um, school education. We have the pattern that the refugees from Syria are better qualified than from Iraq, and f there's asylum seekers from Iraq are better qualified than from Af Afghanistan. Afghanistan is maybe the problem of integration in the future years. Um, our survey shows that after 14 months of staying in Austria, legally staying as accepted asylum seekers, as recognized um, asylum seekers, only 5% are employed. That's a very low figure. And Austria and Germany is paying for unemployed, recognized asylum seekers a relatively high sum of social transfer. We get, gave them 850 euro per month as a an, as an transfer. Um, Germany um, gives in, in, in the system of Germany 400 euro, but um, paying the rent of the flat. So Germany, Austria, and Sweden is relatively generous um, in this social benefits. Maybe this is an argument why these three countries are so popular um, as asylum for the asylum seekers. But now we have in Austria and in Germany a very hot political debate. Is it fair uh, to pay persons which are not living in Austria before so much social transfer? Or is it, w wouldn't it be better to wait a little bit. Milton Friedman once said, welfare system or open borders. That's possible, but not welfare system and open borders. Integration or burden, there are cultural differences. In our unpublished um, study, um, I have to wait that our minister will make a press conference, then I can publish it. So please look at the numbers, but forget immediately what you can read here. 88% um, of these asylum seekers in Austria are Muslims, 8% are Christians, and only 2% without any religious belonging. Um, if you ask Austrians, you would get a number of 20% without any religious belonging. 60% um, declare themselves as religious, one-third pray at least three times a day. Um, um, around 80% say men and women are equal, uh, but 86% want that women should wear um, a headscarf or a veil. Um, democracy is seen as the best form of government. However, 21% prefer a unity of state and religious. So it's absolutely clear conservative and religious attitudes came back, and this is a challenge for our modern and secular society. My last chapter, um, policy response. Policy response, what can we observe now, how EU 28 and the nation states are reacting to that situation? One is clear, we, 
we want to increase the control of the external borders of the European Union. Um, this, is, this is consensus. We have to do much more in that respect. What could it be? Um, it could be uh, a controlled, a control entrance into the EU 28, um, establishment of so-called hotspots, um, hotspots which are responsible to register asylum seekers at the border and don't, don't wave them through. So at the border, they should be registered. In these hotspots, uh, the procedure should, uh, should uh, going on. The decision, if asylum seekers are entitled to stay, this decision should be made in these hotspots. It makes no sense if the asylum seekers cannot prove the reasons um, following the Geneva Convention um, it makes no sense to let them into Europe when there are no real reasons in the sense of the Geneva Convention. So within these hotspots, um, the decision has to be made. And if the decision is negative, then from these hotspots, the repatriation and the return to the transit countries, for example, Turkey, has to be organized. Um, one policy response is also clear. This is combating causes of flight in the sense of root causes. So the principal causes for migration, let's say to some extent, the uneven world um, um, is responsible for the root causes. Uh, so um, improvement of the living conditions in the existing refugee camps is one possibility. Um, improving the living conditions in potential countries of origin in Africa and in the Middle East is also a possibility. But everyone knows this is a long, long-term um, agenda. agenda. Um, we have to have a long breath um, to be successful in this fight against the root causes, against the economic um, unevenness and diplomatic initiatives for resoluting conflicts. Break it, very difficult to break it. Um, this can be seen and observed in the Middle East now in the last month and years. Um, diplomats are important, but not always successful. Another policy re response in the nation states is reducing the attractiveness for asylum seekers because some of the asylum seekers are maybe labor migrants which are using this way to enter countries like Germany, Sweden or Austria. So these countries are reacting um, and reduced um, the attractiveness. You can talk about a comp competition of unfriendliness um, because the country which is most friendly will have to take over the most of the, of the refugee migrants. Um, so temporary asylum is now um, discussed. That means um, you get a three-year asylum grant. And then after three years, we look what happened in the country of origin. Or we don't give you, let's say, 400 euro. Um, we gave you less. And the other parts are, uh, are um, maybe for rents or for other um, outputs. Um, or we try to make a fast repatriation of asylum seekers um, from the so-called safe countries. Um, that's important, especially for Germany. Or we limit the family reunification. So it's not allowed for asylum seekers when they are recognized immediately to bring the family in the countries. They have to wait maybe three years, maybe five years, or until they have enough money um, to, um, to, to feed a family uh, and have enough flat room. Or well, one another policy response is, um, and here you see our foreign minister, um, Mr. Kurtz, um, and the man beside um, you can recognize as well. Um, um, we introduced 
um, immediately after, after we, 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 we observe that many migrants, many refugees will stay, something like an integration plan. Um, it's necessary to um, begin with integration measurements as soon as possible. And these integration measurements are German language courses. Without any German competence, um, accepted asylum seekers do have no chance to get a, to get a qualified job in Austria or qualification measures to increase the employability. Um, because a qualification gained in Afghanistan is not transferable to an Austrian labor market without any requalification. And we introduced something what we called value programs. Uh, value programs to, to explain um, accepted um, asylum seekers what is a democratic, secular, and liberal society? Okay, so to sum up, um, to sum up, the European asylum crisis is a real serious political challenge. I would say it's more serious. Um, it's more serious for the political system than the financial crisis, um, Brexit the Greece budget crisis. Because within these asylum crises, people are involved. People which can be shown via television in the household of each European. Human rights are involved. Social values are involved. And religious attitudes um, are involved. So this is going much more deeper to the heart of the Europeans than the money. Who can evaluate what does it mean 1 billion euro? Um, I'm not possible to estimate it. But I can see what happened if there are religious conflicts. We can observe a polarized ongoing discussion, and I made it here in such a way to characterize this. The one part is arguing why Europe is responsible for the conflicts. We did not invite the refugees to come. This is one statement I often heard in discussions coming a little bit more from the right side. The others are saying the Euro European Union is a, com is a community of values and we have the humanitarian obligation um, to provide a shelter for the refugees. This coming more from the, from the left wing sides. And these are two polarized um, different arguments and different perspectives how you can see the issue. And this polarization is a, is a th threat for the unity um, within the countries and the EU. If the EU is not possible uh, to give us plans how we can manage the situation. Therefore, I would say the return to an effective border control as well as ways and measures to provide asylum for those who are eligible, these are the important steps. Um, and there is hope. Um, and with this hope, I want to close. Thank you. Dr. Fassman, thank you very much. Uh, very, very interesting uh, and, and very deep issue. I wanted to start with a question, if I may. And you did mention the role of the media and journalists uh, in the migration crisis. I wonder if you think from your expert perspective, that the media has been potentially irresponsible or inflammatory in the way it's covered the crisis? Um, the media are important, as I said. Um, and we observe two different phases um, corresponding to the media, um, to media coverage of the issues. Um, one was until uh, the New Year in Cologne 2015. Um, up to that moment, I don't know if you, if you recognize this event um, in Cologne. Up to this moment, uh, um, the media was very generous and said, there is no issue, there is no problem. The people are fine, the people are qualified. Um, we have to take them over. So a very, a very humanitarian perspective. Um, and if there is something going on, uh, don't report about it, don't write about it. 
Then came to um, Sylvester, uh, the new year, in 2015. Um, and the, the, the media said it was a fine, happy new year in Cologne. And in the social media, uh, the people wrote, no, it was not fine. There was a lot of um, sexual harassment um, of North Africans um, in, in Cologne. So the social media um, was quicker um, than the official media. Uh, and this was, how I can say, this was um, not a good situation for the media. Since then, the media are very correct um, and report in a, in a way, I would say, it's fair um, and not ignoring events like that. But how do you face the problem that, if I'm informed correctly, specifically of North Africa, I can understand extremely well from the 300 million people living in Africa that maybe half of it would much, much better live in Germany, Austria, Sweden, obviously, but we can't take all of them. And if I'm informed correctly, the acceptance rate of asylum seeker is close to 1%, meaning 99% are coming but not getting asylum. And also the problem seems to be that the countries are not willing to take them back. So they have nowhere to go. How, how can you solve this problem? I mean, politically, maybe, but it's very difficult and takes a lot of time. Yes, that's true. The acceptance rate of the North African asylum seekers in Germany or Austria is very low. Algerians, Tunisians, they have no chance to get, an, uh, to get a, uh, a political asylum status. Uh, the situation is different for Syrians. The Syrians maybe 80 percent, 90 percent. Um, Afghanistan is around 40 percent. Um, yes, it's low. Um, it's low because um, th th this is a uh, conflictual region, yes, but you have to prove that you personally um, be affected by this, uh, by this conflict. That's, that's a difficult. Um, Iraq is a little bit higher, so the average is around 47 percent of the asylum seekers, they get a status as, as a approved asylum seekers. Um, but that does not mean that the 53% are sending back. Um, some of them could not be sent back because of the so-called non Um It's not allowed to send people back in countries where there are conflicts. Um, so this is the case in Afghanistan and in uh, in, in Syria, so the people are staying in Austria or Germany in a very unsecure situation. What is not good for the people um, as well as for the society? The question of um, returning agreements or Rücknahme über Abkommen, readmission agreements, yes. That's, that's, uh, that's a job for you, uh, for the diplomats. Um, um, I would I would give the advice, the European Union as a unity should negotiate, should, should negotiate readmission agreements and not each country for itself because the European Union has a much more political and economic power. And my second advice would be try to make packages, packages. So if you take asylum seekers back, then we give you help, economic help, or we have maybe privileged relation to universities in countries like Tunisia and Austria. So make packages that the countries of origin of the asylum seekers not only have the feeling we have to take over what the Germans don't like, no, we can gain something out of this negotiation and contracts. Well, what the first, they're interrelated in a way. The first would be how long, on average, is it taking to process applications for asylum? And presumably there's an appeal process, there is here. And so once you've gone through, I mean, do you have rough statistics on that? And the second, and I suppose related question, is the idea of hotspots, which presumably would have to largely be in places, the first place of entry, Greece or Italy. And what response is, is Europe getting from Greece and Italy? And, the idea that you get thousands of people turning up, having to be detained, and that in itself might be worrying, and, and then processed in these places, it's um, probably, no doubt, extremely difficult. What response would Greece, Italy, and other countries who'd be responsible for the hotspots 
after that kind of suggestion. How long the process takes? Um, the statistics in Austria say um, we have now um, an average from, for eight months, eight month average to came to the first decision. Um, I would say that's too long. We should invest more resources into this process to give the people earlier um, the clear answer to their request. Could you stay or you have to return? That's important. This long period of insecurity is, 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 is a bad period. Um, so th therefore we have now eight months and I hope that our government is able to invest it to make it shorter again. Um, one problem in this procedure is you have the possibilities to appeal and to appeal. Um, and sometimes this two-stage appeal appeals is, is taking time, some, a lot of time. Um, the hotspots, um, and as I understood you correctly, you want to s s ask me what is the opinion of Italy or Greece? Pardon? Yeah, presu or presuming that they're the countries where the hotspots will basically be located. There might, might be others, I don't know. What, what response do they give when the EU says, you know, given people could be detained, if you like, for quite yes. a long time, which is a horrifying prospect, yeah. actually. What, what response does the EU get from the potential hotspot areas? Um, so, the, for, for countries like Greece and Italy, it's clear because they undersigned the acquis, so they knew when they undersigned that there are Dublin regulations um, are on the paper. Um, so they knew that they have to take over the responsibility in case when refugees are coming from the Middle East and these countries are the first countries of the European Union. So therefore the official opinion is yes, we take over the responsibility. The so second opinion is then, okay, but Europe has to help us to provide resources that we can take over this res responsibility. So that means financial transfer. I would say my opinion is that's okay. If countries like Greece is taking over this procedure, they should get money from other countries because they're doing what other countries have not to do. So we have to pay for these services. The, the, um, um, the opinion of the people in the, in the hotspot areas in the island, so far as I know, they are angry about it. Um, they have the feeling that they have to shoulder all the burdens um, of this European asylum um, system. Um, to avoid this feeling of taking over all responsibility would be increase the speed of procedure in these hotspots. But this is not working well. Um, uh, Germany is offering officials that they should come to these hotspots and helping and taking over some of the work. But Greece is not willing to take over these officials uh, because this has something to do with the national pride. Um, it's our duty and we have to do it. Greece is an important nation or Italy is the same. So European cooperation can be improved in that respect as well. Um, I would like to ask you, um, uh, first thank you for the wonderful presentation, very level-headed, very rational, I uh, really appreciate it. Um, I have one small question about um, this 850 euros. Uh, is there any analysis uh, how much of that money stay in Austria actually and how much is sent uh, to other countries? Because um, there will be more countries willing to take refugees, but um, the main problem is uh, they can't afford to give such generous social security and uh, sometimes in not in hard currency, which is important for these migrants. So um, I would like to know whether you have some insight into that. And one more <laughs> substantial question. Uh, can you please tell me your opinion or tell us your opinion on the cost of the migration crisis for Europe, especially a um, new divide between West and East Europe? And uh, <clears throat> um, we can see that um, there was a huge disagreement between uh, Western countries and Eastern countries about how to deal with the crisis, 
how to deal with the break law and order. And um, um, I think uh, Europe as a union um, pay the prices for that. So if you can tell us something about mm -hmm. your thoughts. Thank you. You announced your statement as a small question. Um, <laughs> Now there are three big questions. Yes, and I am afraid we're out of time, so maybe we can have a brief synopsis brief. and there can be a conversation we don't afterwards. Know, we don't know exactly how much trend, how much from these 850 euros transferred to the home country, but we estimate one third um, to help the family in Syria or Afghanistan. Um, this social transfer, but I have to say, this social transfer is not made to finance families um, in the home countries. Um, so it's a problem and it's an issue um, in Austria as well as in Germany. The costs, um, hard to say, we calculate in Austria 2 billion euro per year. Germany is calculating 20 billion per year. And our hope is, uh, what did I say? Euro, yes. Uh, our hope is that this is an investment in the future. So we hope that the people came into the labor market will pay taxes and pay this money partially back. But it's an, it's an costly investment for the future. And only my third comment is, my personal opinion is, um, the Commission should avoid um, to divide Europe between East and West to say the bad Eastern European countries, they are not willing um, to take over refugees and the good Western European countries which showing solidarity. Um, this is not a good way to solve this situation. And they have a lot of sympathy um, for all these people, for all these politicians which are trying to convince that the common European solution would be a good solution, but to convince and not to command. Thank you. Um, Dr. Fassman, you've given us a wonderful introduction and some potential solutions to what's obviously a huge topic in Europe. We'd like to thank you from the FCC with a small gift. I hope you'll wear it back in Austria, and we look forward to seeing you in Hong Kong again. Thank you very much.